Hello. Hello. Welcome to what will hopefully be one of the most awesome panels here at Gamer X uh, or session or whatever. Uh, no, seriously, thank you guys for waking up at uh, 10 a.m. I know that, uh, yeah, or long before, you know, but, but you know, when I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect because I'm a night owl. Um, you're at Gaming for Good. And I didn't know this until like a couple hours ago that there's actually another Gaming for Good panel with like the exact same title, except instead of just one dude, it's like four people. And I'm sure it's going to be completely awesome in its own right. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be able to attend. And so if anyone goes to that, um, please get in contact. I'd love to hear what they actually talk about. Um, hopefully, what my talk will do will be a bit different um, because we're going to be looking at a little bit of kind of the philosophy and like some of the thoughts behind whether or not games can actually create any sort of offline social good. And then we're going to kind of look at a couple of examples of, you know, ways that this thing is being done. But I'm actually going to try to get through my talk as quickly as possible just because I know what I think and I'm not here just to hear the sound of my own voice. I'd, we have a large collection of really engaged, neat, uh, you know, possibly progressive thinking people here uh, who might have their own ideas about how to, you know, create good through our gaming world. Um, so, I, my name is Daniel Villarreal, and um, I've basically written for like any major LGBT publication that you find online, like The Advocate, Toll Road, Queerty, uh, you know, Metro Weekly, uh, I mean, you, you name it, and I've probably written for the site, After Ellen, uh, Backlot, you, whatever. Um, I'm also a community organizer. Uh, I do, you know, uh, some activist stuff uh, with, you know, kind of national organizations and locally where I live in Dallas. Uh, and then that's all my contact information. I will be putting a copy of this slideshow in PDF format through my Twitter account. And so if you just want to follow at Hispanic Panic 79 uh, or check it out later, I'll be sure to add the hashtag, you know, uh, GamerX. Um, but yeah, so I, I used to play games like crazy when I was a kid, right? Like I was one of these kids who like really hated the outdoors and like my mom had to like shove me out and like I'd get poison ivy and like ants would attack me and like I would just like scrape at the door like a kitten just being let me back in, I just wanna play, you know, more Mario Brothers where nothing can hurt me and where I have actual power because like I, you know, I couldn't climb a tree, I couldn't catch, I couldn't throw, like I liked biking and I mean I wasn't like, you know, totally incapable but I just, I just, I played so many games. I mean, like, I cannot tell you how many hours on, like, the original Final Fantasy, uh, you know, all the Mario games, everything, uh, all the way up to, like, you know, Super Contra on a 64. And then after the 64, I basically kind of stopped playing because I think at that point, like, most games kind of became either fighting games or first-person shooters, and the graphics were a little too good, and I was like, it's kind of like real life, and I just... Didn't, I just stopped. Um, these days, the only pl games I actually play are things like, uh, you know, uh, online games that are really kind of simple. So things like, uh, you know, like Bubble Witch 2, or uh, I play Duolingo, which is a really, really great free uh, language learning game that, you know, you can just play on the toilet and, like, you know, improve your language capability. I also, I also like to play something called um, uh, Shadow Era, which is a great free online magic style type card game. Um, and it, I, I cannot recommend that one strongly enough. Um, but I play these games because now they take up a heck of a lot less time. I can just kind of do it like I said on the toilet uh, and then just go back to all the other things that I, I hope to be doing, which are kind of offline oriented and like I said, community, uh, community stuff and all that. Um, so I want to tell you a small story that kind of will lead us into what our talk is actually about. Um, so there's an organization called uh, Queer Bomb and it started in Austin about five years ago because their pride event was highly corporatized, and it was mostly just, you know, uh, most people who attended were just white folks with families. Uh, and it started to exclude others, like people who wanted to show a little bit of flesh or people who were into kink, things that were generally regarded as not family friendly. And, you know, when we talk about family friendly, what we actually mean is we're saying not corporate friendly because Wells Fargo doesn't want their logo right next to the picture of, you know, some like large dyke and like leather, you know, with her, with her cheeks hanging out. Um, I would love that, but they don't like that shit. So, uh, in Dallas Pride, we felt the same way. Our pride was highly corporatized, politically impotent, uh, cost prohibitive, and culturally limited. The entire thing was covered in corporate advertisements like Pride brought to you by Bud Light, you know, or uh, Gay Pride, would you like to sign up for a Wells Fargo credit card? It's got a rainbow on it. Um, and so it's like pretty much meaningless, right? Uh, and it had like floats full of city officials, some of which had voted against us in the last year uh, for equal protections for lesbians, bisexuals, and transgender people. Um, and so we ended up throwing something called Queer Bomb, and that was basically our own community-funded event that had like no corporate sponsorship, was free to everyone, and uh, allowed anyone to attend. 
Um, and you know, there was like a political rally with you know some performance and political bite. There was a march, and then afterwards we had this big after party with you know queer performers, and it was pretty cool. So we had like 434 people sign up on our Facebook event, and they showed up uh, for for all of it. But in my opinion, that event is pretty much useless unless we can turn all those people into neighbors who are actually willing to change Dallas's queer culture by staying engaged in local issues and helping us plan different sorts of community events and initiatives throughout the year. And that's a lot to ask someone, to ask anyone to do, because it's a heck of a lot less fun than coming and listening to people you know, complain about politics or drinking and dancing at a drag show, right? And so I began to wonder, um, how, can we, how could we turn that online behavior, those 434 people who signed up for our event, uh, into you know, real world change? Or, or how could we make online behavior itself such that just by playing or doing something online, it actually begins to change the world itself to address real problems like social, you know, discrimination, hunger, ecological waste, and natural catastrophes. And, and to be honest, like, I don't really have an answer for this. You're gonna find out in this talk, like, we're really kind of in the primordial stages and like beginning stages of what we're figuring out we can do. Um, but hopefully, like I said, during the conversation, we'll figure it out together. Um, so the thing is, is whether or not we can change the world through gaming, the answer we have right now is like possibly. There's a lot of evidence to suggest we can. And the idea becomes all the more interesting when you consider that some people consider the entire world and all of life a game in and of itself. Um, so there's this you know, philosophical concept called determinism, uh, which is kind of a little philosophy 101. Basically, it just says that everything in, that happens in this world is because of cause and effect. And so every cause, everything that happens is a direct result of what immediately preceded it. So A causes B, B causes C, C, and et cetera. Um, and so each result and each thing that happens in this life not only contains uh, elements of the things that caused it, but also seeds for the things that are going to happen immediately after it. Um, and it's, a lot of people compare it to a computer program. So it's like what comes out ends up being a direct result of what goes into the computer program, um, which totally shatters the idea of free will, right? Because if everything only happens from what happened before it, then nothing really happens independently. You know, everything from the clothes you wear, things that come out of your mouth, anything, it just, you really didn't have any choice in it. You were just kind of programmed like a computer to do it and the entire world works like this sort of computer. Um, that's a bunch of crap, <laughs> all right? Uh, it's, it's intellectual hooey. It's really neat to think about and it's, it's useful in all sorts of analogies and social thinking, um, but come on, we have free will, right? And, and, and random crap happens all of the time. Uh, Margaret Mead, she's, um, I actually don't know who or what she did, but she has this great quote that said, uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we kind of have to reject this idea that the world is literally just a computer program or just a game that we happen to be, you know, kind of automaton players in. Um, but if we see the world as kind of a game at large, a bunch of, you know, things that have positive feedback, that uh, present new, new risks and challenges, opportunities for us to exert power, to build community, things like that, we end up being able to exercise a lot of free will in these things. I mean, the instant any game is released, the first thing that people start looking for are like cheats, hacks, hidden areas, like the limits of the game. And they're just like ve velociraptors testing the fences, trying to figure out how much free will can I actually exert over this thing. And so we're just looking for this deterministic model to completely break down as soon as we get into the game. And that's a good thing because creative game, uh, game developers end up rewarding you for that sort of you know, transgressive behavior. Um, and then ones who didn't quite think of all the possibilities that their players would come to end up discovering all these great glitches and like limitations of the game and trying to expand it out and make it something that is a lot more like the real world or a lot more immersive, right? Um, and so when thinking about you know, whether or not games and our gaming actually changes anything, it might help to first start thinking about like stereotypes um, when we think of like gamers and what gaming is. So, you know, most gamers, uh, you know, in kind of the negative public eye, because the only time you ever hear about video games on the news is when there's a mass shooting, right? And so uh, what you get is you get like basically this idea of gamer as troglodyte, just a sort of like angry, dumb, you know, oh, I don't want to win and beat, you know? Uh, and so like they're geeky and they're awkward and they're antisocial and they're violent and let's be honest, quite stupid. Um, and like really, really non-productive. You know, your mom's like, get out, of the, get out of the couch, you know, get a job. If there was, if there was payment for, for rescuing the princess, you'd be a millionaire by now. Um, and and we're, we're time wasters, right? So, th so that's like the negative, the negative uh, capacity for what we do. Um, 
we get a really, really bad rap as far as you know, how we're presented in media. But we know that uh, from tons of research that this is wrong from the get-go because at the very least, gaming can change the gamers itself, the people who are actually involved in the gaming. Um, there was a talk by a guy named Sean Farrell entitled uh, 10 Reasons Why Gaming is Good for You. And he basically said that gaming, uh, anyone who participates in a game can automatically improve their capacity for emotional expressiveness, especially considering how often you end up losing and how frustrated you get uh, on games. Um, that it can increase your hand-eye coordination, physical reflexes, spatial reasoning skills, um, you know, abilities to process huge amounts of visual information. It, increase, it could increase your capacity for teamwork, decision-making, uh, self-confidence, and uh, also abstract thinking, which is interesting when you think about the possibility of being able to control your dreams, to be able to create new images and new things, uh, not only on a computer, but in your mind. Um, being able to conquer fears, you know, like sometimes you're like, oh, man, it's this boss, I don't know how to beat it, and like it just keeps throwing fireballs at me, I don't know where his weak spot is, whatever, but you keep trying over and over and over again until you're no longer frustrated or completely destroyed, you know, by that thing. Um, and, and it really, like, the, the amount of things that we've seen in video games, like, I'm sure you're like me, but like growing up, the video games that we played were like a million times better than like any music video or like any movie that you had seen because like it just brought dreams to life, right? It's like a moving painting. And so um, it really encourages abstract thinking and then it can also uh, you know, uh, decrease stress and depression. So at the very least, uh, games are changing the people who play them. Um, these same people will probably go out and behave differently in the real world after playing these games, the same way like after playing Mario Kart or Grand Theft Auto, you feel like you can just slam your car into like any other car or person. Um, and so, uh, you know, we start to think about, okay, well, who, who exactly are we talking about? How many gamers now are these people who are being actively trained to, to do all these things that, that we just listed? And um, Considering how many people now spend you know, a great deal of time playing all sorts of games on screens, uh, we, we have a name for these people. And anyone who is basically, who grew up in the age of digital communication, so anyone from kind of like the 90s on, uh, is now referred to as a digital native. Um, these people spend usually over seven hours a day engaged in simultaneous forms of media that's available 24-7, 365, through a variety of devices, you know, laptops, cell phones, iPads, Wi-Fi. And um, one researcher at Carnegie Mellon actually said that the average young person today in a country with a strong gamer culture will have spent about 10,000 hours playing video games or online games by the age of 21. And that's roughly the same amount uh, as a kid with perfect attendance all the way from fifth grade to graduation, all right? Um, it's also the amount of time that uh, the author Malcolm Gladwell said in his book Outliers that a person would need to spend studying and practicing something in order to become a virtuoso master. All right, and so we end up basically kind of creating media geniuses in a way, or media virtuosos, um, by the time that they're you know, age 18. Um, research has also shown that a large number of these people who are doing these sorts of online, you know, these digital natives, um, are actually, um, they're actually going online to play games specifically. And, and we know that because games are immersive, interactive, and emotional experiences, that they're a great way to teach people by forming emotional bonds and mental bonds. Like they use sight and sound, they create a sense of urgency, like you need to save that princess. Um, they give you a lot of exciting new risks and allow you to accomplish tasks that are really epic. It's usually like save the neighborhood from zombies, you know, or like save something from destruction. Um, and so, you know, from the get-go, you're able to explore new worlds, build entire cities from the ground up, save the planet. Um, and, and studies have also shown that students who engage in digital gaming are a lot more likely to engage in civic and political activity. Uh, they play an active role in society, they tend to vote, uh, they tend to contribute to charities, they volunteer, and they also stay well informed with current and political events through a variety of social media. Um, and just so you know, I actually will putting, be putting the presenter notes online as well, and so all of this stuff has like sourced material that you can go and look up. Um, I won't be citing it here, but it, it's all been, all been proven and supported with a lot of statistics. Um, of the teens playing online games today, we know that 65% are using the web to search for information on politics. 64% uh, have raised money for charity. 64% uh, like civic participation by contributing on political or news forums. And then 26% have attempted to influence others to change their minds on any number of political issues. Um, with the 
proliferation of affordable low energy consoles that work from wireless phone access rather than kind of cable or broadband internet access, we know there's gonna be at least 1.5 billion more gamers in the coming decade. And so it's a population that's immediately gonna grow. Um, in a February 2010 TED talk from game designer Jane McGonigal, um, she said that, quote, collectively, all of the World of Warcraft players have spent 5.93 million years solving the virtual problems of Azeroth. To put that into context, 5.93 million years ago was when our earliest primates uh, ancestors stood up, all right? So that was the first upright, upright primate. She added that humans spend about three billion hours a week playing games, and that if we wanna solve problems like hunger, poverty, climate change, global conflict, and obesity, she thinks that we need to aspire to play games for at least 21 billion hours a week by the end of the decade. And she, she wasn't kidding about that because through her research and, and, and what she had observed, she saw that um, gamers end up doing a lot of things right off the bat to start to build community and start to change and shape the very worlds that they exist in. So we know already that gamers in an immersive gaming environment are actively changing the culture they're involved in. Uh, gaming is an easy way to make a community because everyone involved in any sort of game is creating a world bound by common values and rules, right? And there's a certain way of dress. I mean, just you know, look at the people in cosplay or look at the people wearing kind of these you know, ironic gamer shirts. Uh, there's a certain sort of parlance, uh, common language that we use if you're kind of in the know of, you know, there's a certain language that you use if you're playing Magic the Gathering or if you're playing World of Warcraft, right? And so this convention in and of itself is an example of the sort of community that's created through games. Um, but she says that video games and committed video gamers excel and experience the world together in four very specific ways. And one was urgent optimism. It's basically the desire to immediately tackle an obstacle and save that princess. Um, second was building of a, a social fabric. That is, when you play a game, like you're kind of exposing yourself. You might lose. Um, you might suck at that game. You might be pwned like a noob. And there's that involves a lot of risk. You have to kind of inherently be like, oh, I'm willing to learn, and I'm willing to trust, and willing to make mistakes, and ask questions, and all of that. And hopefully, by the shared values or rules, you quickly love the game, and all of you become invested in playing it as well as you can, playing it well, and, and, and getting all the way through the end. Um, there's a sort of blissful productivity that we have, right, um, when we play a game, because we feel happy, we feel good, it's like we're accomplishing something, and we stay stimulated and engaged on the task, and we do something together. And in the end, as I said earlier, there's this epic meaning, because you're always saving something, or like, you know, winning, you know, like controlling the entire city, or, you know, slaying the dragon, or whatever. Um, so... This is a lot different from what we actually experience in the real world. So in, in a game, you know, you end up becoming immediately active with a trusted group uh, doing a world-saving world, ta a world task and like you're supported by others. You get positive feedback, you get level up really, really quickly in your skills and you see immediate results of good, all right, that, uh, from what you do like on a massive scale. The only problem uh, Jane McGonigal, the, the woman from the TED Talk said is that while gamers feel like they're capable of changing virtual worlds, they don't feel that way about the real world. Uh, she said, quote, and I don't just mean, you know, good, gamers don't just feel good as in successful, although that's part of it. We do achieve more in game worlds, but I also mean good as in motivated to do something that matters, inspired to collaborate and to cooperate. And when we're in game worlds, I believe many of us become the best versions of ourselves, the most likely to help at a moment's notice, the most likely to stick with a problem for as long as it takes, to get up after failure and try again. And in real life, when we face failure, when we confront obstacles, we don't often feel that way. We feel overcome, we feel overwhelmed, we feel anxious, maybe depressed, maybe frustrated or cynical. We've never had those feelings when we're playing games, they just don't exist in games. Um, what we have is something that the economist, uh, economist uh, Edra, Edward Castronova says is a mass exodus from basically the real world to virtual world or online game environments. And we're using games to get away from everything that's broken in our world, real world environment. Everything that's not satisfying about real life, we're supposedly getting from games, right? Um, so it's at this point that my, slide, uh, my presentation begins to break up a little bit um, because I now want to discuss basically the types of games that have been formulated to attempt to create social change. And there are basically four of them. Um, we have what's called a... Um, 
let's call a, uh, let's see, I wrote this down somewhere in my notes. One sec, sorry. Okay. Uh, we have collaborative games, that is games when we work together to come to a common solution. We have community, uh, educational games, games that teach us something, maybe about empathy or about you know, how to respond to a certain situation or problem. We have charitable games, that is when gaming encourages you to donate or to give to something, a sort of you know, socially progressive cause. And then we have, let's see, educational, community, collaborative, and um, charitable gaming. Yeah, so those are four. Um, so we're just going to kind of go through some examples of each, and then afterwards we'll just kind of open it up for a general discussion. So we'll start with educational games. Um, right now, there are several games that have been developed that basically help, pe uh, help teach people how to respond to social problems. All right, And um, these are games like, there's one called World Without Oil. And the idea is that in World Without Oil, there's a worldwide oil, oil shortage. And you can play this game online. And they use your location, they, they use news and geographical information from where you are, political information, to basically give you like updates and pictures and everything to be like, oh man, it is running out. What are you going to do to help conserve it? Uh, because anything that you do will end up being duplicated by a lot of other people and you could very well save your community. But what are you going to do to help with the oil shortage? And so people come up with all sorts of great solutions to you know, uh, reduce their use of energy uh, and to start using public transportation and all that. And they found that people who played this game were actually taking these behaviors that they had you know, mimicked and, and, and put in this fake game and started using it in real life. Those behaviors continued, which reduced impact uh, and, and the use of oil. Um, there was another one uh, called uh, Evoke. Um, no, I'm sorry, there was another one called Food Force, and I think I have a couple of slides of Food Force. Um, so, oh, it's not even showing that. Oh, I'm sorry, man. Yeah, that sucks. How boring. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Is it <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay, so now I'm just trying to get access my desktop. Okay, let's see. You're a genius, thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, um, so the Food Force game. Uh, so the UN actually helps put together something called a Food Force game. And this is another educational game where basically you had to go into I think this like fake city called Karnal or something like that, and you basically had to resolve a humanitarian uh, crisis surrounding food. And so you were debriefed on the situation, um, you had to kind of go and landscape the area and figure out what were the, the areas with the biggest amount of need, where the hunger was kind of most rampant, like that was level one. After you were able to figure out where the food needed to go, you actually had to put the food together by figuring out like, okay, how much does each food element cost in terms of like fat, protein, carbohydrates, whatever, and how can you put that into some sort of, you know, easily transportable, non-perishable, like protein muck or whatever that we can get out there and start to feed people. Um, once you did that, you actually had to do successful airdrops. Um, so you could like completely ruin the food just by like tossing it out in, like in a minefield or like you could actually, you know, like successfully land it. Um, so it's kind of like a flight simulator or drop off simulator. Um, and then you began to get like real world results and you began to see like what some of the consequences were. And what was kind of interesting is that it was, an, it was a good sim in so far as your, your area was still affected by things like natural disasters and war. Um, and one of the things you had to do in one of the later levels was you actually had to figure out how to get the food like past warlords and like civil insurgents and all sorts just to actually make sure that it was going where you needed it to go. Um, how, how could you beef up your security? How could you make sure that people were being helped? Um, and then in the end, you had to kind of basically play this sim that was about, you know, creating a sustainable agriculture or sustainable food practices in, um, in that area. And so this game, believe it or not, is actually for players 8 to 13, 
right? And it's a really, really complicated real world issue, but like, I wanna play the hell out of this game because like, I don't know anything about those things, right? I've never been forced to, to grapple with, with any of those sorts of realities. And so imagine that once we play this game, we'd probably be a lot more capable of articulately, intelligently discussing any of these issues with someone who was interested in kind of food justice, food security, or international aid, right? It would be a huge boon to our, uh, our ability to be, to, to contribute as cosmopolitan citizens, right? Um, let's move on to charitable gaming. So the idea behind charitable gaming is it's really, really simple. Uh, you basically, you, basically um, you, you give money to help, help things out. So you guys may have heard of Cinder Kitten. Um, Cinder Kitten was something like this, this cute little fake animal created by the World of Warcraft um, that they would sell to, to players for about like 10 bucks a pop or something like that. They started selling Cinder Kitten and then another uh, creature that was like some sort of reptile dragon thing um, to basically raise money for two different things. Um, one of them was the uh, Japanese earthquakes. Um, and then I, I think the second one was, let me look. World of, I think it was like a, I can't remember, but I think it was like hurricane, like a hurricane or something like that. But basically, um, they ended up raising. Does anyone here know what the second one was? Superstorm Sandy. Thank you, Superstorm Sandy. It's on the oh, <laughs> okay. So, so the reptile, the reptile was the one for uh, the earthquake, and then Cinder Kitten was ob oblivious to me uh, the, for the victim of the Superstorm Sandy. Um, they ended up raising millions. Through, through, through this, you know, just little digital kitten, like this fake kitten. Um, but it was awesome, you know? I mean, like, all, all of a sudden, all these people came together and bought something, uh, you know, because it kind of gave them some standing in their community, right? It's like, ooh, you have Cinder Kitten too? You obviously care about people. That's sexy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good gamer, right? Um, but, but there are other sorts of charitable uh, giving uh, that we see in games of all sorts, right? So uh, another example of this is, you may have heard of the hum Humble Bundle. Right, and so what Humble Bundle is is it basically gets a lot of um, pretty good games from local developers uh, or independent developers rather, and then they bundle them all up in a package and they tell uh, anyone on the web they're like you can come and download it and just pretty much pay what you want, right? And we would our, our minimum payment is like around like I think the one, the one I did, the minimum payment to download all ten games was like five dollars and ninety three cents. But you could pretty much donate if you wanted to. And if you were a really, really cheap bastard, you could just pay a penny and you could get all of it, right? And what was cool is the more that you donated, you could actually determine where the financing for those things went. And so you could give the money back to Humble, Humble Bundle so they could keep doing things like this. You could give it to the game developers themselves so that they had a financial initiative to keep putting out really good games. You could give it to um, one of two different charities. One of the charities was the elect Electronic uh, I think Frontier Foundation. They're kind of a free speech and kind of digital rights uh, group that does a lot of kind of political awareness and uh, kind of lobbying. Uh, and then the other one was, I think, this organization called Child's Play. Um, and Child's Play basically helps provide games and um, kind of gaming mentorship to children in hospitals and also children in domestic violence shelters. Um, they've ended up like helping out over, I think, like 700,000 kids um, in the short amount of time that they've been around. And so it's a really, really good, worthwhile thing. So just by playing a game and encouraging players to shell out a little bit of money to do it, they ended up actually affecting offline humanitarian efforts um, that, that made a difference in a lot of people's lives. That's pretty powerful. Now, this brings us to the third type of game that I was talking about, and it's what we'll call um, collaborative gaming, all right? And so in collaborative gaming, what we have is, um, you may have heard of this, because this actually happened through World of Warcraft as well. Um, so when, I think, that, I think it first started maybe when there was like, a, it wasn't an earthquake in, in, in California. I think it might have actually been that huge tsunami that happened that one Christmas morning. You remember it like wiped out like all of Thailand or something? And um, so what this group called IRL, and I think it was called the Internet Response League, what they did is they basically took a lot of Google images and a lot of images that had been collected and relayed through uh, Twitter. Um, and people who were waiting for World of Warcraft to load up, they were like, hey, probably pretty bored, huh? You've probably heard this song a million times. We have a small game that you can play for just a little while while you're you know, waiting. Um, what we would like you to do is we would actually like you to uh, take a look at some images that we've gotten and uh, basically rate them 
Uh, tell us, you know, if it seems like everything in the image is okay, or if it's maybe some issues, or if it's a downright catastrophe. Um, and what this allowed them to do is it allowed all these people basically to cycle through massive amounts of, of media that was being created in real time through the catastrophic event itself, all right? So, like, whenever any natural catastrophe hits, you immediately get tweets, people want information, people want on, on location, you know, visuals, things like that. And so, any sort of independent humanitarian group to do this all on their own, so for example, like, I think the Digital Humanitarian Network, it would have taken them at least five days to cycle through like a big chunk of information created in just like eight hours, all right? So all of these little squares that you can see up here are supposed to be like individual tweets and pictures and things like that and they have to go and sort through it and it's just, you know, it t it's a humongous effort. But then if you were able to outsource that through, you know, say World of Warcraft and you had people kind of cycling through all of those things, they said that if everyone in, on World of Warcraft was involved, you could probably get through all of that stuff in about 1.5 minutes, all right? And if everyone in League of Legends was doing it, it'd take about 30 seconds. And if everyone, if every Facebook gamer was doing it, it would take about seven seconds, all right? Now, the thing about this is, it's, it's cool because it can in, then be integrated into a lot of games that already exist and there's a lot of, it, it can basically be implanted. So it doesn't, doesn't need to be like you create an entire game around this very one thing. You can create a very simple interface and put it into an already existing, very, very popular game. Um, but the, uh, the, let's see. The downside about it is that there's still some gamers who are just gonna be like, I'm not helping anyone. I'm gonna wait for this to load. I like this, I like this World of Warcraft game song thing. I like waiting. Um, and so it was like, how do you begin to incentivize that? How do you begin to encourage people to do it? Well, kind of like the flame kitten thing, you could, uh, you, you could start to give people different sorts of awards or give them different sorts of social standing. Um, you can give them things to put on their profile. Um, you, there, was, uh, there was a game um, through the World Bank, actually, uh, that was called Evoke. And the thing about Evoke was that it happened in the, uh, in the year 2020, and you were supposed to basically work to solve some of Africa's most pressing problems, right? And it was, I think this like, I can't remember, it was seven week or seven month game. But the idea was that once you were actually finished playing through the entire game and it encouraged you to read articles, to share images, to create content, um, and to go and like to read like this really well done graphic novel uh, that kind of got you immersed in the experience. Once you were done playing all seven weeks or seven months of that game, the, the World Bank and the UN would basically send you the certificate that was like, you went through it. And like you actually understand some of the real problems that we're dealing with and like, it ended up being something that you could actually probably use to, you know, on your resume or to kind of help you do all sorts of other things. And so it sort of increased your social standing, which is a really nice real world consequence and reward for, you know, basically going through uh, a module like that. Now, the last type of game uh, that I want to talk about is uh, basically called community games. And the thing about community games is these tend to be specifically offline games. Now, these games can be assisted by use of social media, you know, or electronic media, all that. Um, but the idea is that it's get, it gets a smaller group of people actively working on some sort of issue. Um, so for example, there's a, there's a company in the United States called Go Games. And Go Games basically has, um, they arrange all sorts of games for you and either your company or your neighborhood to play. So usually it's just things like scavenger hunts. Right, where you go around the city and maybe you find things related to, let's say you're a, uh, you know, a, a food security group. Maybe you have to go and find the local community garden, and then you go there and you know you, you plant some seeds and you kind of learn something after talking with someone. And then they give you a, uh, you know, uh, one of those QC codes, and when you when you put it into your phone, it tells you the next location to go to in the scavenger hunt. And that sort of thing is like a food pantry. And then you go there and maybe or like a soup kitchen. You go there and like your task is to make the soup, right, and to serve soup for like an hour or so. And then you get the next QC code, and then you're told to go somewhere else. And the idea is that this entire time, like you're taking photos of it, yeah, you're documenting it, and you're also learning kind of how some of these things in your community actively work. All right. Um, they they also do things like uh, uh, movies, where basically you and your company or whatever are asked to uh, kind of go through and like either rescue someone or to sort of improv in all sorts of situations. And someone's recording the entire thing. And so you and your group can actually create this sort of improvised short form, or, you know, artistic film that's just based around a game. 
Um, and then the last thing that I thought was interesting that they did was they do what are called spy games. And the idea is like, they will actually kidnap someone that you know or take something that you love hostage. Um, and they'll get a group together and they'll be like, all right, everyone, now we have to figure out how to, you know, go and go and save this person. Um, you know, and it, it, it ends up being kind of a scavenger hunt type game too. But what's great about it, the twist is someone who's in your team playing the game is the person directly responsible for them being captured or taken hostage. So it's not only about finding the person, it's also about finding the rat, you know, and like, and basically, so it ends up being really treacherous and really involving um, and, and gets you immersed in a different sort of play. There was another game um, that was developed. Let me look at this real quick. Nigeria. Yes. Um, the game was called Ready. Um, and it was developed by uh, a university group that basically wanted to um, figure out a way to help Nigerians uh, kind of plan to, to sustain their own communities. So I can't remember which Nigerian community it was, but there's a sort of monsoon season where basically uh, a local water source would become flooded and all of the Nigerians would basically have to move, or all of the people in that community would have to move to a higher ground, right? Which, and, and they basically became squatters like on a plateau for a while. The problem was is that people already lived on that plateau. All right, and, and so they were kind of like, well, we understand you need to be here, but you kind of come here every year, and you kind of leave at the same time, and you just use the community, and then you go, and we have to deal with it, and it's kind of invasive and rude. Um, and so what, what this group did is they went out there, and they were like, let's create a game called Ready. So we have this problem. We, the, the, problem the urgent problem is immediate, right? Flood, and it's going to happen every year. And... They know that there are things that you can do to safeguard your home against this flood. Um, and they also know that some of the men or some of the fisher, fishermen from the village uh, are also going to stay down in the flooded area to, to get the, the, the fishing crop, basically, which leaves them at risks uh, for things like crocodiles and angry hippos. Um, and so there's a lot of danger. All your possessions can be wiped out. All of a sudden, you have to figure out new food solutions or this completely new plateau that maybe you've never even been there. You know. Um, and so what they did was uh, they had everyone basically go up to the plateau and they said they had them uh, go in different groups and the groups in the groups they were like all right floods coming what are the biggest issues that are coming up like what are the, what are the biggest problems coming up and so the people got together and kind of brainstormed and they were like all right cool uh, and then they were like all right well um, how what do we need to do to repair we need sandbags your house we need to start creating perishable food storage we need to start doing all these things and so they made a list of all these things and then they were like now you need to rank these things from kind of like most complicated and on a scale of most complicated and also most important to do and so after that they were given a value of like well, each of these things was given a value of one through five um and then you know there was a lot of debate and discussion over what's important what do you need to do whatever and then the real game began and so the game ready was played basically like this is you had a team of about like eight people and these different sheets of paper that had the tasks that had to be done um, were placed around this gigantic field all right and the higher your problem was in complexity the more people you needed to successfully tackle it. And here's how they did it. They gave all of these people in these groups basically a six-sided die. And they were like, now run out and go find those papers. And everyone ran out. And when you found a paper, if you found one that was easy, like, you know, like, put water in jugs and get it ready to go, I guess it's easy. Um, th they would basically, you had to roll a one. And as soon as you rolled a one, problem solved. Good, go. And you were done and you could go out and find the next problem. But if you ran up against something hard like, put together medical provisions and medical teams so that we have healthcare in this new place, and it had like the rating of a five or whatever, or a six, you basically had to roll six ones. And if, it was, if you only put one person towards that problem, they could be there all day waiting for you know six ones. But if you had six people on that problem, and they all rolled a one, bam, like, and you're done, and you could roll back in. And then they would bring everyone back in, and they would kind of talk about, okay, based on this experience, like what, you know, what, what did we find out? Um, and so, the talk basically ends there. What, what, we're, what we end up having is a several, several different modules that can potentially help uh, create positive offline social change. Um, but as I said, they all seem to be in the kind of developing phases. And as of yet, um, there are very few games where if you say plant a tree in the game, you end up planting a tree in real life. Now that sort of thing actually does happen. There are a couple games where if you, know, you buy the flame kitten or you plant trees and another organization will go out and do it. Um, but, you know, like I said, these are just these are just the beginning baby steps. Um, anyway, I'm sure there's a lot I skipped or whatever, but 
I'd like to open up for any sort of conversation or questions. Um, are there any things that you guys are doing, seeing uh, trends? Are there any questions you have about things going on in the material that I covered? Anything like that? Yeah. Mm. You're absolutely right. And, and you know, I, I think the thing with a lot of online games especially is it does end up being kind of a classist entity, right? Like you have to be able to afford the gaming console or afford the access onto the internet in order to do these sorts of things. Um, it seems like in some ways that's beginning to get lowered uh, just because of you know, the proliferation of, of these technologies. Um, but, but, but yeah, no, you're right. It's, it's interesting seeing them using kind of a, a multidimensional complex. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So when you were talking about digital natives, okay, which ties into what you were just saying, hmm? how much of that is a question of class versus a question of generation? Mm. So uh, a lot of those positive things you were citing, um, is that because the digital natives come from relatively privileged backgrounds that have access to that technology, and that also leads them to be more engaged, more involved in uh, social good, or is this something Um, I, I would definitely say there's a huge digital gap um, and that it is primarily being driven by the technology itself. Now, the, the one thing that starts to, I think, to re remedy this a little bit is when an online gaming entity or an online game actually pairs up with a group that's already in existence. So if we go back to the tree planting thing, um, so there's a game where this, you know, kind of Earth Day organization was like, if we can get 100,000 trees planted in this game, we will go out and plant like 10,000 trees elsewhere. And so the cynic in me would be all like, well, why don't you just plant the goddamn trees instead of making people go through the motions of doing this needless crap? Um, here's why. is because what you're basically showing through that sort of online involvement is that there are people who are interested and committed to these sorts of issues. It ends up building a sort of statistic and metric for how willing people are to engage in an online way to resolve a local issue. Now, I think with more partnerships like that, uh, you could end up beginning to bridge the gap, not so much in getting electronics to uh, people you know, who can't afford them or get access to them, but also to uh, get, um, to, to start working with groups uh, that directly involve the people affected by them. You know, and so, like I said, you know, domestic violence shelters, things like that. Um, those are those are some ways to do it. It's it's also interesting to note that another type of uh, gaming, uh, type of charitable gaming, are actually organizations that are helping to make games uh, more accessible by uh, you know handicapped people um, specifically. And so these people end up developing controllers that are you know controlled by your eye or by your chin movement. You know, if you're a quadriplegic, um, and so. I think we'll increasingly see a desire to get more and more people on the inside of that, but I frankly don't know how to kind of solve that digital divide. Um, it's, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, how, how many people here do we have that actually play, say, like World of Warcraft or League of Legends, would you say? Can you raise? No? Okay. So a fair amount. Um, there were a couple of interesting things that might just leave you with a little bit of brain candy um, for after this talk. Um, so just one image about, you know, mind-blowing facts about Facebook games. Um, so we have like, you know, 53% of Facebook users are the ones playing games, you know, and that's out of a total of, you know, 500 million, 500 million plus Facebook users. And 90% say they're addicted. Addicted. Um, of these addicted people, 69% are women. So it's interesting that 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 you know, 70, almost 70% are the addicts, and they have this little hypodermic needle going into their arm right here. It's nice. 20% um, uh, of people who have been playing, or I'm not sure if this is the addicts or the people who play, but have paid for in in-game cash benefits. Um, and you know, you have 56 million people playing daily, which is more than all of England. And then uh, 290 million people playing monthly, which is pretty much almost everyone in the US. Um, and then per month, you basically spend like 421 minutes, seven hours and one minute on Facebook anyway. 
and that 50% of people going to Facebook are there specifically to play games as well, you know, or only to play games, you know? Um, and that you basically end up with like these, you know, 927 million hours uh, per month. Um, and that that's, that's, you know, 100, one, sorry, 105, 878,000 actual years of virtual farming. Um, and so it's this idea yet again that if we can actually take that amount of time uh, put towards this, um, that, that we could potentially create more change. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, quick thing I wanted to mention was if you want the talk from the note, if you want the notes from the talk, I, I'll be putting them momentarily on um, Hispanic Pan at, at Hispanic Panic 79 on Twitter. Also, I'm giving another talk tomorrow at 10 a.m. about game addiction, which is a talk I gave last year. It's called The Effect of Game Addiction on Queers. Um, it's a little bit more developed slide-wise than this talk. So, uh, you know, uh, if you can come out and do it, I would love to have you. Anyway, thanks everyone. Have fun.